we'll just get a little, we'll get a little started here, a little housekeeping. Um, Nance, did you find it? Yeah. What does it say? To complete the course orientation, located in the course document. I was like, where, what's the course document? What's that mean? Like, I didn't know where to find that. Like, okay. Course documents. Under, can I, can we yeah. get to that after? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, question I want to make sure all right. I got out there before. Yes. <laughs> and make sure you, I'll write it down then, you have a question. Because if I don't write stuff down, I don't remember. Okay. All right. Um, question. Okay. 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 You're looking for course documents? Right. Okay. Like Did anyone else have problems finding course document documents for orientation in your... Syllabus? No? No. Okay. All right. So, welcome. I'm Francine. Yeah. <coughs> Ashley. Allison. The first one's Megan. Oh, not Michelle. That's Jennifer. Michelle. Yeah. And then on the bottom in the wee little ones is... Heather is on the right, and Bailey is on the left, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, a little few housekeeping things first. Um, here, for us, and you guys should figure this out if they haven't already told you where your fire exits are, if you needed to evacuate here at this facility, we go straight out this door, straight down, hall and the stairs are right there which take us down and out the building. Um, hopefully we don't need it and apparently you go down those same stairs and you can get water or whatever you need. Um, they did tell me today that if you have your calendars because you may want to if you if you plotted out your classes according in your calendar for each week there are weeks that they're closed because of the holidays. So you may want to note that Thanksgiving week, there's no classes. Christmas week and New Year's week. But there's two weeks there, there's no class. And the week of February 19th is no class. So that just added like three more weeks to the end of this class. Sorry, guys. Um, she, Nancy is going to talk about, um, at some point she's going to come back in and talk about how to be notified if there's snow days. Um, she said the rule of thumb, if they're closed, is she there? Oh, if, um, they're closed, if they're closed, I was just talking about the snow days. She had said if, if the facility is closed during the day, it will automatically be closed at night. But I'll let her speak more to that. Okay, so I'm Nancy, and I'm the Director of Adult Education in Rumford, Region 9, Mexico. Snow days. If we're closed during the day. So if you go online and you watch all those lists and it says Region 9 School of Applied Technology is closed, then we're closed. Okay? Even if it becomes beautiful in the afternoon, sorry, they close in the morning, we're closed in the afternoon, at night. If it's during the day, if I think it's going to be bad weather here in Mexico, I try and call it by noon, definitely by 2 o'clock. We'll put it on our Facebook page, so it's Region 9 Adult Ed on Facebook. We try and send out emails and make phone calls, but I believe I'm supposed to call Jamie and let her know and then you will um, get notified, okay? Um, I can't guarantee we'll be doing the call, but I think Jamie said she was. And then if you check and it says, I will then go online and put it on the, Channel 6 is the one I put it on. Um, channel 6 and it says Region 9, Adult Ed, then we're closed, okay? And last year we had nine snow days. I'm not planning for that many this year. Please. Please, right. God, no. Oh, right. 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 So I also want to say that one of the rules is no smoking on campus. 
Actually, if you're a CMA and you're smoking, then we need to talk. But um, no smoking on any campus, any school campus. And on that, this school, that means you're going across the street. And we all know what that's like, because it's route two, right? Not fun. Um, what else can I think of? Figure out where your fire exits are. And anything else you can think of? That you I think about? that was it, and I told them where the water bubble was. Okay, all right. And the three of you ladies, I do need to see this after tonight sometime. Okay, all right. And you have a fourth one coming, I believe, right? Yeah, I, she's not here yet, so okay. I'm going to go ahead and get started. All right. Um, We're very excited I mean, to have you need them for a long period. It's, should they just go one at a time now? Or? No, no, I can't. i got to go to something else. Um, okay. Starting at 6 o'clock, I'll be in my office pretty much. All right, so if somebody just want to walk down, that doesn't, you know, if okay. you want to do it a break. Okay. I can do it as a group because that's the individual. All right. Okay. okay. All right. Y'all have any one? questions? Nope, not yet. All right. All right. I don't know what happens if your site's closed and we're open. Because you guys are down in Brunswick Topsom area, right? Correct. Yes. That means you won't have electricity for the next six months. <laughs> I, I, I need to clarify again with Amy, but I think we had this discussion, and I have some timers. I don't have Alzheimer's. I just have it sometimes. <laughs> but I believe she said if any site is closed, we will not be having the class. Okay. Sounds good. But we will clarify that. Okay. All right. All right. Have fun. Take care. All right. Cool. All right. Um, there's candy there for you. There's candy there for y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Chocolate always gets you going. So first, some little housekeeping things. I just want to make sure that the list that I got out has um, your current phone numbers and your current email addresses. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. All right. Okay. Do y'all have my email address? No. All right. You want it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's F like Frank, P like Peter, R R E A U L T at gmail.com. And I'll give you all my cell phone number, too, in case you need to call me or if you have questions. You know, I'll be available. I work full-time, Monday through Friday. So um, if you have a question and you want to call me in the evening, that's fine. So my cell phone is 603-781-5467. Um, and I'll help you the best I can if you have questions or stuff or you just want to talk about something. Now, we're going to have a different instructor next time, right? We will? You, you gonna be Thursday nights, you guys will have a different instructor for your clinicals. Okay. They'll be stuck with me on Tuesdays. Okay. Sounds good. Till the end of March. <laughs> Ugh. All the holidays. As long as being in a relationship, we get all the holidays together. That's great. <laughs> okay. Um, what I'd kind of like to do is just go around. The way I kind of teach is I'm very informal. I like to move around. I'm not going to sit here and read the book to you. You're all adults. I'm sure you read the book. I don't need to re-recite it to you. What, what my role in, is is to facilitate the information, reinforce the information, have a dialogue with you guys, um, help you to understand it, whatever questions you have, and to make sure you, you're ready to take the exams and to be available for you when you need help. So the classes are going to be really informal. Um, if you have questions, feel free to interrupt me. If you think I'm going way too fast, interrupt me and say, you know, say can you slow down? Um, I don't care if she asked a question and she asked the same question. If you still don't understand it, be like, I, it's just not clicking. Because sometimes things just don't click until you've heard it five different ways, five different times. And that's, that's fine. Um, on the other side, if I'm going too slow and I'm like beating something to death, then I want you guys to be like, yeah, we've heard this ten times. We got it. Um, let's move on. Because it is, it's, it is like 16, 17 week class. There's a ton of information that we have to cover in a short period of time. So we kind of want to move it along as best we can. 
but I want to make sure you're understanding what you're getting. Is that fair? Yep. Okay. So when we talk about, in the first chapter, the community-based education and everything, and they talk about um, learning styles and things like that, I want to, I want to get to know y'all and find out um, kind of what your background is. What, you know, are you right out of high school? Um, have you had a job? Um, what's your learning style? So if we can just go around and kind of talk about yourself. Um, we may as well start with Megan. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, I have two and a half years of college, but then I got pregnant for my son, who's now two years old. Um, so I decided to come back and do uh, CMA, and eventually I want to do the nursing program. Um, but my learning style is definitely like writing everything down on a note card and like doing it 6,000 times. Okay. <laughs> and what were you going to college for? Um, I was undeclared, so I took all my general ed classes first. Okay. And how, how did you, um, what were your study skills like? Um, basically using note cards or reading things over and over and over again. Actually, I'm more like of a hands-on kind of person. I can sit here and listen to you forever, but I kind of have to be hands-on about everything. Right. Okay. Um, Jennifer. Yes. <laughs> I am, I, I have four kids. I was a stay-at-home mom for 25 years. Um, I have been a CNA for two years. And I want to further that and do my CMA instead. Okay, so how, when you went to do your CNA, um, what sort of study, ha study habits worked for you? Um, we had a small, intimate class like this. Um, a lot of it was hands on, and a lot of it was review and review and review. And that seemed to have worked really well for me. I had okay. no problems when it came time for the test and all that. And I don't test well. <laughs> okay. And we can work on that. Um, okay, good. <laughs> so a lot of this, you know, so you may have a lot of valuable information that you may be able to help your peers because you already have some of that medical background. Correct. I've taken the medical terminology and I've done things like that. So, yes. Awesome. And Michelle. Hi. Um, I'm... Uh... <laughs> I have two children, 21 and 22 years old, two girls. Um, I am quite old, so I have had a, you know, a lot of different experiences in education and work. Right now I work full time in the hotel industry, and, um, but um, I was a nursing assistant about 30 years ago. Um, trained and worked for a, a year in some big city hospitals and enjoyed it very much. So I have, there's a lot of medical in my family. Um, so that interest, I think, sort of runs in the family. My grandmother right. is a nurse. Um, I wanted to be a nurse several years ago after the CNA experience, but I went and did one night in the chemistry class, and I was so fearful of it that I just quit everything of it all together. Um, oh, but but um, so I'm, I'm doing this now um, in addition to the hotel and um, and see where it all takes, takes me. All right, so you have some medical knowledge, but your hotel industry experience you can help and share with others your the people skills, how to deal with, you yeah. know, aggressive personalities and yeah. and the customer service part because being yeah. a medical assistant is a ton of customer service. Yeah. Um, so you have that those skills already developed yeah. and maybe I've, some of the techniques you can pass on. I've only been in hotel now for a month. Prior to that, I was in education for 20 years. Um, so, um, but I have already learned in the last month um, to watch people's directions and be alert to what they seem to need at the moment. So, for example, if they just want to get out of the desk and get 
onto their room, you just let them be, you let them go. You don't um, give them the big spiel of the hotel, you just let them go. So yeah, so just learning what people seem to need at the time and, and um, responding to that in an appropriate way. Yeah, I'm just learning myself actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. And what's your best learning style? You know what? I really don't know. I've never known. And I asked my sister who's been a lawyer for 40 years, and she <laughs> says, I really don't know what mine is either. So it sort okay. of was strange reading that first chapter. And I just couldn't tell you. I, I've never, I've often thought about that. What is my best learning style? I, I have no idea. How did you learn best in high school? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I was definitely an artist in high school. Um, I did best in my art classes. So I would imagine okay. my two children are great artists, better so than I. And I would imagine we're hands on, hands -on. visual type right. learner, I would imagine. Okay, yeah. good. Um, Bailey. Um, currently, I work in a bar. I bartend, and I just kind of realized that I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life, so I started this class. <laughs> so you have huge community um, customer service skills on yes. how to deal with different personalities. Yep. Good. And have you been out of school long? Uh, yeah, for, uh, since 2012. Okay. Um, what do you think is your best learning style? Because you had to learn how to make all those drinks. <laughs> Definitely hands on. Okay. Good. Um, I already forgot. Heather? Is it Heather? All right. Well, um, That's I'm, Heather. A <laughs> I'm a mom too, and um, I'm, I was a CNA, but I had to let that go under Rutgers comp and got hurt on the job, so they're putting me through school to. Um, my application while I wait for my fourth so shoulder surgery. Um, so hopefully I can get back into the school thing because I'm 31, but um, I am more hands-on, so hopefully only having, you know, a couple people in the class, we can really talk about things, you know, and uh, I'll be able to learn that way instead of hands-on. Right. Sm small groups is good. And you have the experience of being the customer, so you kind of know what it feels like to be on the other side. And you'll right. remember how you may have been in a situation and how people treated you and how it felt. So that would be good information, you know, to share. Uh, Ashley. I have a 40-year-old son. Um, I work full-time. I used to have my CNA, but then I kind of let that go and decided to do my medical assistant. I currently work at the hospital cleaning. Okay. So again, you have some medical background, which would help with this. And being in a hospital environment, you're exposed to the clinical, you're in the customer service. Yeah. And Allison. I have been a medical transcriptionist for 30 years, and um, I have also worked in real estate and in my associate brokers. Been in nursing school for a year. I have five children, four stepchildren, one daughter of my own, um, and I help my, my husband run his business, which is a fiberglass business. Oh, so again, personal skills, um, customer service skills. And how do you best learn? It's been a while since I had to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I used to be like hands on when I was in nursing school. I did better with hands on stuff, but we'll see. Okay. And you? I forgot to ask you. Yeah, that. I'm hands on. I take a lot of notes and do flashcards. Okay. Camera? Yes, I have two girls. Um, one's 20 and the other one's 18. Um, have their careers. <laughs> um, one's my 18 year old in college, and my other one is a hairdresser. Okay. Um, I work at the Memorial Hospital as a central registrar, um, so I have medical 
yeah. background. Um, I also work as manager at um, the flagship cinema in Oxford, so I have a lot of uh, hands-on with their movies and production, and very much customer service related. You need to make sure that they are happy. Yes. <laughs> Especially if that film breaks. Right. Well, they don't make films anymore, right? No, it's <laughs> like a projector and it's, everything's digital. Everything. Dating myself. Who's the other one that's, when it was on the reel and it would break and it would spin? <laughs> and the thing would go play? You young people have no idea how traumatic that is. Because you can't just, like, pop it back in. You gotta splice it and you're sitting there. <laughs> Or they feed it so that the mouths are talking, but the sounds over here alternate the lips, and it just screws you all up. Um, well, I've been a registered nurse for over 34 and a half years. Um, majority of my career was an ICU nurse. Um, I've done some ER nursing, and I did one year in OR. I didn't like it. Um, I was a school nurse. Um, I did a lot of quality and um, a lot of precepting education. So I, I have like a very well diverse, if it's, if it's in nursing, I've probably done it. Um, so this is awesome here to be able to share all this stuff with you. Um, like I said, I work full time. Um, and y'all have any questions for me? Oh, how you learn? I was too eager to talk about me. Uh, I am, I'm all of the above. Like I learn visually, I learn uh, hands-on, I learn because uh, I'm very critically, I think a lot. I even overthink myself, but I'm fantastic. It's like, they're trying to trick me. <laughs> Just because that's how my brain works. Right. But I am very much everything, all rolled into one, so. When I have to think about things, it takes me a little while to think about things. Um, but more or less, I am visual. And okay, so good. We all seem to have the same type of learning needs. Um, it talked in the book about, um, you know, the beginning of the class is prepping you for the end of the class and everything in between. So it talked about starting to get your portfolios together. So as you do things, um, get signed off of things, put it in a little folder, your certificate, so you have that um, when you go to, at the end of the semester, you will have all your certificates, of certificates of completion, everything that you've done, um, and then you can set it up into a nice little packet when you go to interview for it. <coughs> You'll be able to say, oh yeah, I did that, and I understand this, and I'm proficient in this, uh, which makes you that much more marketable. And it's better to do it as you go along than it is to be the end of March trying, oh, what did I do back in November? Oh, I can't remember. I can't find that piece of paper. So if you just start collecting all that and putting it aside, you'll just be that much more organized. Um, so we've talked about the learning styles. Um, you guys went through your vocabulary so you know um, how information is perceived and processed. We've all talked about how some of us really have to read it over and over. I think, Megan, you said you had to write it down many times. And and I'm kind of all over the place, too. I, like, you know, in, in doing this prep, I took all these notes, not because I wanted to rewrite the book, but writing is repetition, and the more you write it, bringing it from paper to brain to putting it out, it it's builds that rep repetition, and you're able to understand it and retain it more. And if you take notes during the class, to review them immediately, freshly, make changes, um, like if you just kind of wrote down a little blip and you, and you think, oh, I'll remember that. You may not, if you just wrote like two words. So if you review them quickly when you go home, then you have time to add in little extra things that may help you to remember it easier. Um, let's see what else. Um, so if you looked at the types of 
um, learners you are. So, Megan, which learner do you think you would consider yourself? Abstract or concrete? Hmm. Can you skip me? I don't know yet. <laughs> okay, well, concrete. I kind of think you're more into the concrete with a little bit of abstract because you like to watch, observe, and analyze the material and, and know the step-by-step -step process. But you also are organized, you take notes, you do outlines, and you do by repetition. So you right. learn by doing, so you're kind of a both. Right. Is what I would say. And, yeah. and I, think, I think that kind of holds true for everybody. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. And I think, I think Heather, not Heather, Misha, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you, you're probably more into the concrete type of learner, seeing, doing, actions. Mm -hmm. And that's what I hope to portray. I'm, I'm hoping that we can facilitate that because that's how I kind of teach is by, I'm always moving. I'm French, so the hands are going. I'm um, French too. <laughs> I knew there was something with the Megan. <laughs> Do you talk like this too? Yeah. All the time. I'm surprised you haven't noticed yet. <laughs> um, so I kind of always, I'm, I'm not one to sit here and just read. So um, moving forward, processing information. Do you jump right in or do you think about it? <laughs> so she's reflective. And it sounds like maybe the rest of us are more active. Yes. Okay. Um, then it goes into the concrete reflective and the abstract reflective. And, you know, it's abstract active. It basically all says the same thing in different ways. Um, abstract reflective likes to learn works, doesn't like to work in a group, prefers to do things solo so they can work at their own pace. Um, abstract active is you want to experiment. You want to know um, how things work. You want to physically see them and put them together, and you prefer working in small groups. Um, and a concrete active is one who takes the information, puts it all together, figures out how it works, and is one who is more apt to be a teach somebody else or you know work in the group and kind of be the leader of the table if you're working in a group to facilitate things. Um, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on what kind of learners we are because we already know. So the next is helping to you to be successful in this class is going to be time management how to deal with stressors, how to deal with test anxiety, um, and how to organize your work and your time so that you're not feeling overwhelmed, so that you're not, I mean, who's a procrastinator? Hmm. I'm a huge procrastinator. <laughs> Doesn't work that well, <laughs> sometimes. And sometimes it does. Sometimes, you know, you procrastinate and then you're forced to really get it and then it's jammed in there because you're doing it repetitive, repetitively. Um, it works for some people. It worked, it got me through nursing school, but it doesn't always work for other people. You need to set up time to, time management. How long is it gonna take me to read this chapter? And everyone has children. I think most of have children at home. So managing your time so that you're still spending quality family time, which is important, and finding time for yourself to study and also notching out a little bit of your time for yourself to rejuvenate. Because taking a break, being a mom 24 seven, trying to do a full-time job and a class, when do you have time to take a hot tubby or just sit back and like this 10 minutes, don't anybody bother me. This is for me to reflect and just let go. Because if you don't, it's just gonna become so overwhelming. So it's important to think of ways, little ways, that's not gonna be a huge 
amount of your time that make you feel better? When you get stressed, what sort of things do you do? How do you handle stress? I breathe. <laughs> okay. You focus on your breathing. That's perfect. Anything else that you can share? No? How do you handle stress? <laughs> What'd you say, scream? Yeah. Ice cream too. Ice cream. <laughs> Ice cream. That's how I handle stress. In chocolate. Um, you? Um, normally I just kind of just try to think about being in a nice little secluded island in my own mind and just kind of space out to it. And that's I, perfect. A little meditation, a little self-reflection. Um, how about you all? Um, I exercise a lot. So going for a run or taking my two-year-old to the playground is a stress reliever for me as well. Good. I was going to say, I go to the gym. I try to disconnect from everything and just try to focus on myself for a little bit. Okay. Michelle? Um, well, I think I sort of shut down and inward um, and just sort of shut down. Um I have to really learn how to, because um, I've had a lot of stresses. Um, right. So I, I have to really learn the good skills. I have to force myself to exercise, take my dog for a walk, um, you know, do something positive to get out of the stressful, or the the down situation, but in stressful situations, when other people are stressed around me, I, I shut down, I shut down and then more than sort of calm, um, get very calm. So that's a good sort of thing. When other people are stressed right. around me, I, I get calm <laughs> and okay. sort of just shut Do down. Do you have very, systems around you? Do I have a support system? Good support uh, system can support uh, you. This class and yeah, um, I, I'm um, I'm sort of alone because um, my girls are out of college and in college, and I um, went through a family breakup a couple of years ago, and I'm sort of very alone right here, and I don't tend to reach out a lot to my friends or my I I talk to my family, but I don't. Um, I pretty much, and my family is very supportive. I'm just sort of, um, I do, I mean, the nice thing is at work, there's a woman who also does, uh, uh, and also taking classes, because she's a, um, an EMT, she's not an EMT, but she's like one of the ambulance people, and she's trying to, taking classes to be a higher level ambulance person. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I have at work that person to sort of, you know, uh, 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 bond with in this, in this area. So that's sort of cool. And what was nice was she always said, you can do two jobs. You can, you don't have to, like she works as that. <laughs> she does that 50 hours a week and 40 hours a week does hotel. Plus Jeez. she's a mom. Plus she's. Wow. She's unbelievable, but she's encouraging that, you know, you don't have to let one go for the other. And um, so that makes so she, me... It sounds like you have a good support with her. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, definitely my family, they, they want to support me, but um, I don't know. They're in Massachusetts. I'm sort of alone up here, but I have friends here to reach out to. I just don't what? reach out as... Uh, yeah. Yeah. It'll be all right. It'll be good to hunker down in the winter and do this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How about yeah. you, Heather? Uh, how I deal with stress. Um, I might have a panic attack or two, but then I think about it and then I uh, like reevaluate it and just deal with it. Okay. Do you do a lot of self-talk and have a cup of tea and ground yeah. yourself? 
No, I'd probably just go around the house cleaning up a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. That, that's a stress reliever. You know, my one of my major stress relievers is I cook. I bake. I get really stressed. I'm baking. You, you may benefit. Well, I guess. <laughs> Keep throwing that in our faces. I'm sorry. <laughs> I stress out or I couldn't, I would be like, <laughs> dishes with us. <laughs> no, I bake. It's like, I'll bake in, you know, a lot of my, you know, my coworkers, they know when I'm stressed because I'll show up Monday or any day during the week with like a cake. And they're like, what? I went home and baked a cake last night and I can't eat the whole thing. So, you are. So, sorry guys. <laughs> Oh, wow. We won't eat it in front of you. We'll save it for Thursdays. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> time management, we kind of touched on that. Um, basically, with time management is you just need to determine what your final goal is. Obviously, it's to finish your syllabus, your quizzes, and, um, and, and making yourself a schedule. What works best for you? You know, this night I'm going to work from five to seven and I'm just going to read this chapter. And whatever works for you is how you're going to effectively manage your time. If you find that you're getting behind and you need more time, um, this program is flexible that you just have to be, make sure you're letting, letting me know that, you know, I'm just not able to keep up and I need some more time. And we'll work with you the best we can because we want you to be successful. And we want you to be able to take the test and pass the exam. And having said that with the tests, um, there's no GPA. And you can take the test as many times as you want. So even if you say you got an 80 on the test, okay, you passed. You can go and keep taking that test as many times as you want to see, you know, just to challenge yourself, maybe get a higher score, or just to repeat that information. It's not going to affect, if you, let's say if you got an 80, and the next time you took it, you got a 60, it's not gonna matter. You can just keep taking it. And it's, there's no, like I said, no GPA. So the more you take it, if you have the time, the better that's gonna get reprogrammed into you. Okay? Mm -hmm. But, I said good learning tool. It is. Um, organize. Also, like, you're doing outlines, flashcards, anything that will trigger a memory. If you can relate it to anyone or anything or situation. Or if the mnemonics. I always found mnemonics were great. You take the first... If there's a series of things you need to learn, and you can take the first name, first letter of each one and make it into a silly phrase that will trigger the word, that's really a great way to learn. You know, when I had to learn the cranial nerves, um, our mnemonic was on Old Olympus, Titmos, Top of Finn, and German Golden Hawk. <laughs> it's a stupid little poem, but you remember that the on, old, the, you know, the O, the occipital, the optical, and trigeminal for each letter. So that's that's how I learned. It was good because there was no way I was going to remember them just by memorizing them. I had to stick it in a, in a mnemonic. So think about that and you can make them as silly as you want. It doesn't have to, like they put one in the book, Dow Jones something. Who's going to remember that? That's so boring. Yeah. <laughs> you got to make it fun. <coughs> remember it. Um, not that I'm dissing the book at all. But Dow Jones, what I'm like, that didn't work for me. Um, test taking skills, just make sure you're prepared. Um, don't o don't overthink <laughs> because if you study the material and you and you've done your homework, if you start overthinking. It's when you screw yourself up. You go, I always say, and, and a lot of people will tell you, you go with your gut. The first, if there's an answer and you put it down, 
they say don't go back and change it because when you get the results, you're going to find out that your first answer was right. So stick with your first answer. Do the process of elimination. If, you, if it's a multiple choice and you know two of them are totally off the wall, then that gives you a 50-50 chance of, getting, of picking the other correct answer. Also look for keys. Be mindful of always, never, sometimes. Um, because those will either make it or break it. If it's always and you know one of those answers is wrong, it's, then it's not always. That would be a false if it was a true or false question. Um, same thing with if it's an all of the above. If you know one of those answers is absolutely wrong, then all of the above is not the question. You've just eliminated two. And a lot of times questions, the key or a key word will be in the question and that key word will be in the answer. So you can look for those little things when you're taking tests. I am a horrible test taker. I know it. Um, I have huge test anxiety. So it's, and that's what I had to do is I had to start going with my gut, even though I'm like, Ugh, nope, go with your gut, go with your gut. Um, and reading the question, read, 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 read it thoroughly, every single word. A lot of times in my experience, I like skim the question and I'll see like how many or can these and then the last thing, and I'm like, oh, I know that. But then there was that little word, always, or sometimes. And when, you, when I look at the results and the answers, God, that was such a stupid mistake because I didn't read the question. So take the time to read them. Um, let's see, what else are we talking about? Um, you already know how to critically think. You're taking things, you're breaking it down, you're making it make sense. Um, so I don't think I need to beat that to death. We've kind of already just summed all that up into everything we've got going on. Uh, anybody have any questions about tables and graphs and how to read them and what their purpose is? Do you all understand them? Mm -hmm. Graphs are a little more not my forte. I, I probably okay. Would be able to do more. Okay, so for instance, um, the the useful thing for tables and graphs is it gives you a quick visual of progress or lack of progress. For instance, um, if like you all have children, your baby's weight. You used to go into the doctor's office and they would say the baby is now 20 inches and it's 11 pounds and then you go back the next month and the baby's 22 inches. You know, I, I'm just, they're probably bigger than that, but, um, and it's 15 pounds. So you're seeing that graph, you have your height on your Y axis and the weight on your X axis. Um, and I'm trying to think of a way that you can remember X and Y. Um, uh, let me think. X, you could do as exit, you're running straight out of a place, so it's horizontal. Y um, could be up and down because too many people are asking you why, 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 and it drives you crazy. So it yeah. shoots your mind, you know. <laughs> why are you still asking these questions? So your anxiety level goes up. So maybe that's how you can remember X and Y. Okay. So you plot it out, and I can do it on the board if you need me to, but so you have 20 inches and 11 pounds. Then the next month you've got 22 inches and 15 pounds. Then month three, you'll have 24 inches and 13 pounds. So you can see quickly at a van, okay, this baby's losing weight because you can see it visually. And it works the same way if you're doing, um, if you're graphing out quality indicators. Um, if the doctor, like if they're doing a project in your doctor's office that you want to be involved with as far as how many of our patients got the flu shot over 50? So you can have patients over 50, 
number of flu shots in October, number of flu shots in November, and what your target goal is, and then you can see, okay, we've got a lot of people that got flu shots in November, and then December, we've really lost people, and we're still only at 60% of our patient population has flu shots. What, what then that can give you information is what do we need to do more education? Um, should, be, should we be bringing it up in the initial meeting? Things like that. That's, that's what graphs can do. It can give you anything from measurements um, to indicators that are purposeful for the practice and how to improve, even how to improve patient satisfaction. Does that make sense? Are y'all going to sleep? Am I boring you to death? Not yet. <laughs> okay. Want some candy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know, that was me. Um, okay, so we can go on now to um, conflict, problem solving, con conflict resolution, conflict management. Um, when you encounter a conflict of whatever sort it is, you have to realize, or you have to acknowledge the conflict and ask yourself, is, am I feeling this because it's directed towards me? Um, what are the feelings I'm responding to in this conflict? How important is this conflict to me? How much is it affecting me? And, you know, if it's because the person next to you and I'm not saying this because you've got combos. <laughs> um, if she was eating her combos and you couldn't stand the sound of someone crunching, that could that you, that could put stress on you, and you could be seen like, "Oh God, I wish you'd stop chewing." But how big of a conflict is that? Enough of a conflict that you would have to say to her, "Can you please stop eating?" <laughs> You know, I mean, it's true. I work with someone who says, first thing when you walk into our rooms, I don't want to hear anybody crunching. So we're all sucking on our crackers and getting soft. <laughs> this, because we don't want to upset her because she's going to lose it if you crunch in her ear. Um, no joke. Um, so, conflict with somebody at my work. She kept bringing people out to me. And I'm trying to register people over the phone, and she just kept bringing patients up to me. Um, and she totally disregarded that. So I brought her into the other room, and I said, you know, I don't like it that you are always bringing your patients up to me while I'm trying to answer and register people on the phone. I, and I just told her, I said, I don't like it that you do that. Can you not do that? And I had to do that to her twice because she didn't understand it the first time. Okay. But it was hard. It was very hard, but I did. It was hard to, to address it. Good and very, you know, I approached her and I did eye contact with her. So that, you know, I did the best I could, but she still wasn't understanding it because she still kept bringing people up to me. Drove me crazy. <laughs> okay, so leading that for an example, how would you guys have handled that situation? Anybody? What did you hear what she said? Yes. Yes. Okay. Am I like yelling? No, no. No. Okay. Because she sounded really soft to me, and then I'm like, maybe I'm just screaming. <laughs> so how would anybody can can chime in here? How would you have handled that situation? What would you think you would have done? The same thing that she did. I would have approached it the first time um, in the assertive but kind way. Um, and then if she continued to do it, I would continue to approach her until she understood that it was unacceptable. I would have okay. probably approached her once. And then if she continued, I probably would have gone to a supervisor or somebody that maybe could get through to her. Because <laughs> okay. apparently I'm not doing the job. That's true. All right. Anybody else have any suggestions? Heather? Bailey? I feel like you guys are miles away. Like, <laughs> forever away. Um, there are some things with...
conflict resolution, I mean, first identifying that you, you perceive a conflict. And it's important to look at the conflict and maybe that person doesn't even realize what they're doing. Um, so obviously not approaching them in an aggressive way, like, you need to stop bringing these people to me. Um, <laughs> and, and looking at that maybe I, something that doesn't work when you're doing conflict resolution and trying to, um, discuss something is using you. As soon as you say you, that's going to put someone on the defensive. Like, if in this situation, if I had said, you keep bringing these people to me and I'm on the phone, immediately you're going to get all bristly, right? Um, so if you said, if you called her aside and said, um, Allison, you know, I understand that you're really trying to, you know, to get the workflow moving and that we need to put people through, but... Um, when I'm on the phone and trying to register people and you're bringing someone to me, I can't effectively provide the best customer service to the person on the phone and I'm, I can't ensure their privacy. And, and that's, that might be what she needed to hear is I can't ensure the person I'm on the phone's privacy if, if somebody's back here. And the same goes for that person, you know, their privacy needs to be respected and they and that person that you're bringing to me may feel uncomfortable because they're hearing stuff that oh I shouldn't hear and then this person that's sitting here hearing stuff that they think they should be here are thinking oh my god they're going to do the same thing to me how do I know that my health information isn't going to be overheard by other people so if you maybe turn it that way like you know, I need to ensure that the customer I'm on the phone with is getting my undivided attention and, and doing a thorough job, and I need to protect their privacy. And when I have other people present, you know, I'm not able to effectively do that. And if you could, you know, throw a note on my desk and say, I have another patient for you um, waiting, then as soon as I hang up, I can come get them. You know. It's, it's always best, if you have a conflict, to have some sort of solution of how to make it better. Because if you just go to someone with a problem, um, then you're kind of both left happy. If you go to them with a possible solution of how to make it work better, then it gives the other person something to chomp on and come to neutral ground. So a lot of, what, a lot of things I say is... Um, I feel so-and-so when you or when this happens. So I'm trying to think of an instance. Um, I feel really rushed and like I can't provide good customer service when you bring me a patient when I'm still caring, um, still involved with the patient even though I'm on the phone. It's still just as important. Um, so how can, you could even offer, how can we make this best work for both of us? You need to get them to me. I need to handle the people on the phone. What can we do to make this work so that I'm not feeling rushed and I'm not violating HIPAA? Right. And both both patients are being respected. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. I haven't even looked at my computer notes. Um, so we all, we've all been involved with passive people. We've all encountered aggressive people and not very often do we meet assertive people. Assertive is, it take, it's a, it's a gift. It takes confidence to be assertive and not come across as aggressive. Um, in a busy medical practice, you're going to encounter passive and aggressive people. Um, passive and aggressive people you work with. Passive and aggressive family members. Passive and aggressive patients. And how you handle those situations is going to make or break your rapport 
forever if you're that with that practice. So what I like to think of, okay, so you're all medical assistants at Dr. Jones family practice. We'll just do family practice, okay? And you have a patient come in with the family and a husband, wife, whatever, and they've been waiting in the waiting room an hour and they've just had it. So the only person they've met right now is the receptionist who says, okay, Mr. Jones, yep, we got you checked in. Um, all your information same, same insurance, everything, same phone number. Okay, have a seat, they'll be out with you shortly. How many people have gone to the doctor and that happens? All the time. It's like they barely even look at you. So that's their very first impression. Let's say they're a new patient. Their very first impression to this practice, meeting Dr. Jones. So then you come out. Mr. Jones or Mr. whatever, Mr. Smith, you know, I'll take you back now. And what you say, what you do, and how you act is going to be the tone that that person remembers on, on how well or not well their, their visit went. Because how you treat them and the interactions you have are going to set the tone for they're already getting a predisposed um, opinion of this doctor. Secretary, she didn't care. She didn't look at me. She just, can I have your $20 copay? All right, thank you. So they're already like, I don't really feel like this practice really even knows me or cares about me. And so what's this doctor going to be like if this is who he hires? So the, the medical assistants are the first impression, really, of the practice and the first image and impact that you can make on a patient. Um, greeting them with a smile. Walking beside them to the doctor's office, to the room, not in front of them. Just, you know, they're like, you walk beside them, you know, oh yeah, it's crappy outside today. Small talk. That makes them feel comfortable. It makes them kind of at ease. Um, okay, the first thing we have to do is we have to get your weight. Do you know the only place you can go to a doctor's office is the dentist and they don't weigh you? <laughs> like, I went to my dentist and I'm like, I think I actually like coming here because you didn't make me get on a scale. <laughs> so, um, you know, okay, we have to weigh you. That bothers some people. And it should be done in private. And if it's, you know, some doctors have it like in a little cubby alcove. So respect that. Make sure that people walking by aren't going to see their weight and don't read their weight out loud to them. If they ask you for it, you know, what was my weight? If they're not looking at it, um, write it down because people are sensitive about weight. Don't say, oh, this is your, this is your weight. And because they're going to, they're going to feel like, wow, I'm just I told them back here. I don't want to come back here. <laughs> so then you take them from the weight the scale and then you take them into the room let them walk into the room first have a seat um, or tell them where to sit get comfortable um, meanwhile you've already introduced yourself when you brought them to the door when you called them in hi I'm Allison one of y'all's Allison you're Allison <laughs> Hi, I'm Allison. I'm Dr. Jones, medical assistant, and I'm going to be here and get you settled and get you ready for Dr. Jones. <clears throat> so now you bring them to the room and then get comfortable. <coughs> you tell them what you're going to do. I'm going to need to get, you know, a little medical history. Um, I'm going to have to take your vital signs, your blood pressure, temperature, and... Um, Ask them, did you have a list of medications? Did you bring any list of medications with you? If they're all a new patient. And, and some people may say, well, for God's sake, I called and said I had the flu. Why do I gotta, you know, why are you asking me what I'm here for? You should already know. 
So I like to think that you would say, you know, I know I understand you here because you're feeling kind of crappy and, you know, maybe you got the flu. Um, but I still would like to hear from you what your symptoms are. How long have they been going on? How long have you had a fever? Did you take your temperature? Because some people will say, I've had a fever for four days, but they don't own a th thermometer. They're just going by the lips on the head test. Um, so you can say they felt fever. It's okay. What was your, you say you have a fever, but you didn't take your temperature. So what were the things that told you you were having a fever? Well, I know when I have a fever. Well, how? You tell me. I, I don't know how you have a fever. Um, so they may say, my eyes burned, my ears were bright red, um, flushed. And you're just going to document what they said. For, you know, quote, always quote them, said I had a fever for four days, doesn't own a thermometer, doesn't have a thermometer, states felt hot, chills, burning eyes, red ears, whatever the symptoms are. Um, and if I repeat myself, let me know because like I said, sometimes I forget that I, so it's like telling the same story four times and you're like, I already heard it. Um, so they may, they may be ugly because they don't feel good. They've been miserable for four days and you're asking them a ton of questions. So explain to them that, you know, for me to, for Dr. Jones to get a really good picture of what's going on, I'd like to get a snapshot of everything and have all your information so he can come in and address your needs specifically and pay all his attention to you and the reason you're here today. And he doesn't have, you know, all the other information, your medications you're on, your history will already be there for him. So he can focus on your problem for today. And that kind of makes sense to people. You know, I wouldn't say, I'm, gonna, I'm doing all this so he doesn't have to waste his time doing it. You, it's, I'm giving him all this information so that he can focus his visit on what, you're, what you need to be here, why you need to be here. Um, and if you acknowledge what people, if you acknowledge people's fears, um, frustrations, and you acknowledge it before they say it, like this, so these people may, you know they've been sitting out there for an hour because it's flu season and everybody and their brother is in here trying to get into the doctor. And when you bring them in, hi, Mr. Smith, I'm Allison, I'm uh, really sorry you had to wait. We've just, you know, we've got a lot of sick people here today and, you know, it's not our policy to have people wait. It just happens to be one of those days. And I understand um, your visit is just as important as everyone else's, but um, it's just a little longer to get through. Then they're, then they're like, okay, they know that they know that my time is valuable and you just acknowledge that their time was valuable. So that's going to drop them down a notch from the screech. Um, when you validate their feelings. When, exactly. When you validate their feelings. Um, and that's a lot of times is all it takes is to validate somebody. Oh, okay. Or, you know, if they're there waiting for... Um, a mammogram result. Maybe they're scared. Maybe their mother had breast cancer and the, your office called and said, the doctor needs to see you to go over your mammogram results. What's the first thing you're going to think of? Holy right. crap, I have cancer because why wouldn't he just tell me over the phone? So they may come in irritated, upset, but they're scared. And when I've encountered in my years in the ICU and the ER, people that have come at me, I've had stuff thrown at me, you name it, it's happened. I've been called every name in the book. Um, I'm like a duck now, it just rolls <laughs> off my back. Um, because I've, I've, I've done it long enough that I've developed that empathy where this person is this angry because there's something else going on. People don't just, there, okay, there are a few people who are just miserable, period. And we can't control that. 
But 99% of the time, there's something else that's going on in their background. Maybe they just had a huge fight with their child. Maybe um, some loved one died. Maybe they just lost their job. Maybe there could be a million things that are in the back of their mind that have got them all stressed out and now they have to come to the doctors or go to the emergency room. Um, or I was going to say pain is another reason why people are irritable and you know, exactly. pain or they're sick or not feeling well. Right. All those reasons it's are enough to irritate people. Exactly. So to, to try to think of that when somebody's being aggressive, um, or angry or in your face is to validate, you know, I understand this is a difficult time. I understand you don't feel good. We just need to get through these questions because a lot of people, they're like, I've said this 10,000 times. Um, I did this a month ago. And a response to that would be, yeah, I understand you did. And um, has any, if anything has changed, we need to make sure the doctor knows that. So if there's any conflict with your medications or whatever, and that it's, this is just, this is going to be just a quick review and make sure that you, there's a lot of in, in MAs will just say, okay, well, they're on the computer. Okay. Um, allergies, anything new? Nope. Okay. Medications. All right. Any changes in your medications? Nope. But if they stopped and said, okay, I see that you're taking um, Coumadin, five milligrams, three times a week. Yes, I am. Okay. Um, you're taking your potassium, 20 mil equivalents. Oh, no, I stopped taking that. But they just told you that no medications has changed. Because if they stop taking it, they're not going to remember that they stopped taking it and that they didn't tell you. So it's important to say, okay, I understand not, maybe nothing has changed, but let's just briefly go through these so I can make sure that the doctor has the adequate information and the correct medication list that you're taking. Because some, maybe they have just come out of the hospital and they have a whole new med list and they think that the hospital told the doctor. So making sure the medical record is accurate each and every visit is so important. And that's not just saying accurate, all right, you're still taking your potassium, you're still taking your cardizone, you're still taking your low presser, making sure that the doses are the same, that the frequency is the same, and that whether it's an extended release or immediate release, you need to make sure that the whole order is what they say they're taking. Um, let's see what other things with health record, past medical history. Um, they're going to give you a question, either, you're going to give them a questionnaire that hopefully they filled out. Some, and I'm kind of breaching into the medical record as, as far as um, going with the interacting with the patients. I'm kind of covering both, and I apologize if that's screwing you all up. But um, taking, taking patients' times up, patient, uh, Taking patient time while they're waiting for a doctor can make them frustrated. So doing it as efficiently and accurately as possible and just explaining to them, this is why I'm doing it. And reviewing um, anything they have. Now some medical records have a patient portal where the patient, they send the portal out and the patient registers and fills in all that information online, and then it just gets dumped into the doctor's databases. Others may get, if it's a specialist or something, they may get that questionnaire mailed to them. You want to make sure that, that you receive it, because they don't always give it to the person at the front desk. They may keep it in their purse and be like, do you have the questionnaire that we sent out? And make sure you have it, and glance through it, that they filled in all the boxes and signed it for privacy or whatever. Um, does that make sense? Uh, let's see. Um, so I don't want to be redundant, but if that if I beat that a little farther, it's just 
it's just I can't impress enough. The first impression is what you guys make it. And humor, laughing, whatever, to make them at ease is going to set the whole tone for not only this visit in their first visit with the doctor, but whether or not they choose that practice to come back to. They may have a doctor who's kind of gruff and grumpy, um, but if you all are sweet and they love you to death, they're still going to come back and because you treated them with respect. Make sense? Am I boring you guys? <laughs> oh, I see. Jennifer did kind of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, I can't see Bailey and Heather because they're too sweet. <laughs> so they can be like, oh, so done. Um, so let's see. It, do y'all want to take a break? Pee, drink, anything? It's up to yes. you guys. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> do y'all need to stretch? You. Huh? Okay, because what time does it get over? 8.30? Yes. Oh, it's only quarter of seven. Oh, heck. We can drill you some more. Um, 8.30. We could probably take a break in like... 8? I mean... I can't tell time. How about we take a break at 8.30? That'd be perfect. <laughs> Um, we'll, we'll give you guys, I'm trying to do the math in my head and it's just not working. 5, 36, 37. Seven's halfway through. Does that work? Yep. Okay. I keep forgetting this is recording me. I better be on my best behavior. <laughs> um, I skimmed through a lot of stuff. Um, I hope it didn't go too fast and we end this thing like in the next 20 minutes. <laughs> that would be a real bummer, wouldn't it? Oh, it would be. <laughs> I think I'd be in trouble. Let me just page through this real quick um, and see if I missed anything. Oh, I think we missed over tricks for becoming a successful student were creating mind maps if you needed to map it out. Um, the spider maps, the fishbone, the chain events maps, the cycle maps. Do you all have any questions on those or if they would even work for you? I just got my books yesterday. Oh, that's all right. Then, I mean, whatever questions you have is fine. I read through some. I mean, fish maps, the cycle of event maps, the chain of events and the cycle map, that may be helpful if you're diagramming out, um, say, something like if you're, if you're tracking like an infection, the vector the port of entry for the infection, what happens, and the outcome. That circle chain of events may help you to be able to better understand the cycle of how an infection develops. Um, cause, detail, the fishbone. Um, you could, fishbone could be a disease, like it says here, a disease process. Um, Let's say liver failure. Liver failure is the disease or kidney disease. Um, what would be, there's many causes of kidney disease. Diabetes, um, heart failure, liver failure. So you can put the main disease and then you can branch off and put, what did I just say, kidney failure, diabetes, and then details about how diabetes would affect the kidneys and cause kidney failure. So a fishbone may be effective in that type of scenario. Um, the spider map, personally, and, and y'all can interpret it the way you want, that to me looks very confusing. Yeah. 
I wouldn't find, I personally would not find that effective. I would have to come up with something totally different. But if that's the type of thing that would work for you, great, use it. To me, an outline would work better. But this is your learning style, so make it what you, what works for you best. And I know this program does have some handouts, um, but I think they're just handouts of, of pictures that are exactly in your book. So, I don't know, we really wouldn't need to copy them and hand them to you and give you an extra piece of paper. What questions do you guys have? None. Okay. Um, we went through tables and graphs. Uh, we went through problem, and problem solving and conflict management, prioritizing the involvement, um, evaluating the outcome. And, you know, in, when we were talking about the scenario she was talking about with the her coworker bringing the other patient in, and you guys come up with an, a way, like if you said, have a passing me a note, and you find that that doesn't work, or she finds that she doesn't have the time, then reevaluate it, okay? This, this note is getting lost. It's brushing, it's blowing off my desk, or whatever. Um, can we come up with something else? Uh, sticky, or whatever. You just could if it's, if it's not working, reapproach, reevaluate, and come up with another idea and trial it. And that's kind of, you know, the process for any sort of process improvement. Quality is, you know, evaluate what the problem is or what can be improved. Um, brainstorm as to ideas on how to improve it. Do it to see if it works for a certain amount of time. If it doesn't work, then you go back to the you know, to number three and reevaluate, make a plan, do it, assess it. Is it working? Great. If it isn't working, you could just keep revisiting. It's just a cycle. Um, are you guys pretty comfortable with the passive communication, aggressive communication, and assertive communication? Heather Bailey? Yep. Yeah. yeah. It looks like you guys are tiny little cool bill people way out in the middle of nowhere. Um, they don't say much either. What? They don't say much either, so we'll never know what they really look like or what they're really doing. I know, like little cool bill people. Um, eye contact. Remember, eye contact is key. It's key to setting people at ease. It's key to letting them know that you're actively listening. Um, if you're just sitting there and typing on a computer, when was your last mammogram? Um, when did you last see the doctor? What, why are you here today? Okay, so you've got a cough. You know, pause, look at them, listen, hear them. And while you're doing that, while they're telling you, um, Say they come in and they say, oh, God, I just, I've had this shortness of breath for a week and this cough and I just can't catch my breath and I'm so tired. Make, not just document their simp what they're telling you. Patient says, cough, run down, weak. Ask, you know, ask pointed questions that you'll learn as we go into more of the anatomy and physiology of things. But you want to add in there, um, patient states they've had a cough for a week. Patient has um, deep, congested cough that you can hear, stuff that you can see. Patient is um, leaning forward in the chair on the desk as we're talking. Um, using the body to breathe. You know, so basically, that's going to show you, like, if we're sitting here talking and I'm like, 
yeah, I am really short of breath. And my God, I can't catch my breath for nothing. And oh yeah, I took my wife out to eat. And is that a sign of somebody who's really short of breath? No. But if they're what, what we call tripoding, you know, they're like this, because when you, I'm getting way ahead of y'all, but some of you may understand. Um, when you tripod, like for a person with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, this is the best way for them to breathe because their hands are forward, it's opening up their back, it's opening up their diaphragm and their lungs, and they're able to get air better. So if they're positioned like this, and they can't get out more than two or three words, I have been so short of breath for a week, then that's a trigger that this person really, the doctor's going to need more attention. And maybe he needs to see this person before the first person on the list. So you would gather that information. Maybe you notice that their lips are blue. Um, when you do their heart rate, um, their heart rate's elevated. Um, and if you do the pulse oximetry, it may be 88. Then that person's going to need to be seen before the person who's coming in for a physical. So their, your little pre-initial look at the patient um, is going to be important for the physician too. So what do you think? Yes? That makes sense? Yes. I mean, how mad would the doctor be if this patient was sitting in there and, and the patient's been in the room for 20 minutes because he got talking to a new baby mom with a new baby and they're just chatting and he's no idea that this patient is in his room. He's going to be furious and that patient didn't get good care. So when you're doing your interview, it's important that you look at what their chief complaint is and how is it how is it matching with what they're telling you? Um, if if they hurt their ankle, are they when they when you see them walking to the room, are they bearing weight on it? Are they limping? Um, have them take their shoe off. Is it swollen? And those are things when you're writing down the details of what their chief complaint is, you can put in little things that you see that will help the doctor um, kind of get a better picture. Make sense? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Also, making sure you review allergies every single time. Um, and all allergies. Because some people um, may have developed a new allergy, and they may think, I'm trying to think of an example. Say they said, oh, I had an allergic reaction. Um, maybe they went out to breakfast, and they had an allergic reaction to their scrambled eggs. But they're like, no, I don't have any allergies because they may not think scrambled eggs is a big deal. Being allergic to it, they're just not going to eat it again. But their chances of getting a flu shot and having a reaction because they're allergic to eggs is like so high now. Um, so when you're asking, do you have any allergies? Have you had any new allergies? Have you any allergies to food, to vitamins, to... Um, any allergens in the air, make sure you cover that all because some people will, will keep information because they don't think it's important. Oh yeah, I just, oh yeah, I swelled up when I had some egg the other day, but I just won't eat eggs. Well, all of that can have a trickle effect, so that's important. Um, making sure that the advanced directives, if they're older people, um, coming in with a family member? Do they have advanced directives set up? Um, do they have a power of attorney? Have they decided or discussed what they want in life saving? Do they want to be um, a full code? Do they want everything done? Or maybe they just want to have um, nutrition done. Or maybe they just want CPR, but they don't want to be intubated. So all of that's important to collect and have in, in the chart as well because it's information that is going to be shared with other providers if they have to go to a specialist or something. And if it's an electronic health record that um, 
is shared with the hospital, the hospital has access to everything. And if you do your job well, they're going to be able to, in the emergency room, provide the best care for that patient because they're going to have the most up-to-date, most factual information um, without having to delve. They do. When we get patients in the ER, we do ask them all the same questions. But if their chart is accurate, then we have more time to spend on the emergency. So the role of the medical assistant is crucial on so many levels. Um, so we've covered the subjective data that you want to put into the chart is what we just talked about. What, what they're saying their chief complaint is. Um, objective data is what you're putting in. Their vital signs, um, if they brought any labs with them that they had done, um, if they had any x-rays, they brought an x-ray report, making sure all that get in there um, or is available for the physician. Um, tangible, objective things, it's based, objective is facts. Subjective is what they're saying. So, um, and with those together, the physician can make an assessment and a plan. You're sort of making an assessment, loosely speaking, when you're looking at them and saying that they can't say more than two or three, we call it word dyspnea. How many words can they get out before they have to stop and take a breath? Two word dyspnea, five word dyspnea. Obviously, two-word dyspnea is far worse than five-word dyspnea because that means they can only say two words before they have to take another breath versus saying five words. I've got like 500-word dyspnea, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> if, am I talking too fast? I feel like I'm like blah, blah, blah. No? No. I really don't like to hear myself talk this much. I wish you all were talking more. I'm going to have to start, to have to start asking you guys questions. Um, so, different types of health records. This is these um, American Recovery Reinvestment Act and Health Information Technology. Economic. Those are kind of just boring terms. Um, which I'm probably going to get in trouble for saying that. There's a reason for it. Um, but when it starts getting into all the government stuff, um, they came up with several years ago, and I was actually on working in quality for the Northeast Healthcare Quality Foundation for Center for Medicare Services. Um, back when they started implementing in 2010 in preparation for the electronic health record and going out to physicians' offices and educating them on the importance of why we have to do it, teaching them how to do it, and educating them on meaningful use, and instilling them, well, it's optional this year. It's going to be semi-optional but if you don't have this implemented in three years, then you're going to be a big fine. And it's thousands, you know. So it was mandated that they had to, that hot physicians' offices had to go to electronic health, medical, electronic health records, or they were fined. And, you know, a lot of physicians' offices didn't want to buy into it. And they, and if, and they offered incentives. If you do this, if you get this part, stage one of implementation of the EHR, by the end of October, 2011, I think, 2000 something, if you do that, then we will give you so much money per patient per capita. If you implement stage two by this, so they had an incentive to implement the program, but some just didn't want to do it because one, the cost of the EHR is extremely expensive. Training your staff, all your staff, on how to run it is expensive. And then you need designated people to take your 500 patient medical charts and input it 
in a meaningful manner into the computer. Physicians hated it. Physicians balked it that they didn't want to, um, they didn't want to have to take the time to put the orders in their cell. They like saying to the nurse, okay, order this, order that, order that, order that, and then the nurse is going to, ah, put it in. Um, so it's forcing, it's also forcing the physicians to do computerized physician order entry, which takes out a huge um, barrier for, for errors. If he's typing it in, he's putting in what he wants. If he's telling me, and he's rambled off three orders, and I'm trying to put him in, what are, what's the likelihood of me making a mistake if he's already walked back into the room, and I'm like, okay, what did he say? He wanted me to order an x-ray of, oh, that x-ray must have been of this. I mean, that's, that's setting up for tons of errors. With them, with them doing it themselves, they know exactly what they want, it's put in, it's done. But a lot of old school physicians, that's not their job, that's the nurse's job. So breaking that mindset and getting them to understand the meaning of the electronic health record and how, how it's meant to be used was a lot of work. And we got a lot of grief, but you just gotta kinda make them think it's their idea and how great it's gonna be for them. So, let's take a break. Um, 10 minutes. So Bailey and Heather can, <laughs> can walk up and we can say hi. <laughs> I feel like you guys don't exist. <laughs> Because I got Megan right up front, I got Jennifer, and they're like this big. Great, <laughs> now I know where to not sit next time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the camera puts 20 pounds on them, but I'm not saying that. I'm just saying oh, you're, man. Just, oh, you're just no, you're close and you're close and big, girl. We're going to dope. <laughs> yeah, seriously. We're going to go in the other classroom. <laughs> yeah. It's, all right, I'm just burying myself. But the screen, you're like, they're like on a little laptop screen, and you guys are on a 32-inch screen. Oh, you guys are not that big, but you're like. Bigger than the other. Bigger than the other one. I wonder half how to make them bigger. Half of our screen is just black. Mine too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But you guys, I feel like I feel like you guys are right in this classroom, and they just look so tiny. Yeah. So I feel. Do you guys feel like you're included? Do you don't you don't feel like I'm just not including you, right? No, we can see you fine. Oh, All right. Because <laughs> I don't want you to feel like you're not included. All right, I don't know how to sleep. I'm not studying anything. Call the kid and say good night. <laughs> what? It's early. All right, take a break. Yeah, but she goes to bed at eight. Oh. And I won't be out of here by then. Right. So. Uh, I mean, Nancy, this is the first time I've left my two-year-old ever. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's how I was. Yeah. My kids are 25, 21, 17. <laughs> Yeah, his father's never been left alone with him ever, so that's where he is at right now. And it's the first time my daughter was left alone with her father. He called the ambulance because she was she was so I was teaching D. Yeah. And she was um crying so loud he thought she could breathe. But usually when you're crying that yeah. means you are breathing. Right. And so he yeah, no, um, I hope nothing like that happens. I left for like five minutes one time just to go over to the neighbor's house, and I came back, and he had hit his head on the entertainment center, oh. and he was gushing blood, and I was oh. like, why am I going to school again? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I'm like, I'm fine. 
So do what you can. If you get behind, you know, just let Jamie and them know and they'll make it work. So.
you hear me? There you go. Okay, so where are you from, <laughs> since you say you're French? Oh, where am I from? Yeah. I grew up in Lincoln, New Hampshire. Oh. Um, my grandparents were born in Canada. Oh, yeah? Yeah. So do you speak French? No. No? <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. I just assumed that you were from, like, northern Maine, because I'm from Madawaska. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but... Yeah, I've heard of it. That's why I'm French. <laughs> oh. Yeah. That's, like, almost Canada, isn't I'm, it? Yeah, I'm the, I'm yeah. the slang French, though. <laughs> so you speak French? Yeah. Yeah, it was my first language. Oh, good for you. That's why if you hear me stumble, it's because I'm, like, thinking too fast. <laughs> so you That's all right. I... I have yeah. French heritage, but I speak Spanish. Oh, yeah? And my children's father is Spanish. And my youngest son, <laughs> he, he, does, he can speak French. He took French in, in school. So it's just weird that they have the Spanish heritage, and he kind of speaks French. And I'm French, but I speak Spanish. Yeah, we were required to take French from preschool all the way up till senior year. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome, though, to have to be bilingual. Mm hmm. I just. I do. Um, I have one older sibling, and she has three kids, but she like lost her French speaking language when she met her husband because he didn't want the kids to learn French because he didn't know it. So it just. You lose it really quickly, it quick. especially because up there it's like a slang French. You use both English and French at the same time. Yeah, so yeah. It's but you easy. haven't lost it. No, um, <coughs> it's, it's, I'm it's trying like, to, but um, his father is like, I don't really want to. He'll know it because <laughs> I don't know it. So <laughs> I yeah, like, so yes. we call the first gold gold issues. Gold issues. Gold gold I just call them the issues for his son, but my, his father hates it because he's like, you don't call the pea shoes, they're called slippers. <laughs> so, so it's tough. It's tough to teach them both. Right. <laughs> Hello? Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. That's insane. Those, so they don't phone calls of the Department of Education wants to give you free money. <laughs> Uh, my good friend from college, she mm -hmm. married uh, Parisian, but she is also Armenian, so she yes. spoke the kids Armenian, and they spoke Parisian. She learned, she wow. learned French to to wow. speak with her husband. Insane. And so they were like, yeah, and that's and awesome. I mean, she wrote to be bilingual. It oh, help me. <laughs> 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 Yep. Came yeah. down here. Everybody said I talked weird, and then I've been down here for about four years now, and everyone's like, "Okay, it's finally starting to wear off." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we just talked. Did we get to use that? Yeah. Um. Yeah. So actually, I don't have any family down here. So I don't use it often. So excited. So it does. Fight. Have like ten um, electric ones. But like I said, I'm trying to incorporate it a little bit into my son's life. But it's hard when. Uh, um, yeah, actually, my grandmother is So when I go visit on like Thanksgiving and Christmas, I'm not really comprehended and <laughs> speak it back. So, yeah. I have grandparents who are born and raised and still live in Canada. And Canada, like, was where we went to hang out because it's just you know, walk across the border on your feet. And, yeah. <laughs> Did you remember any of them? Uh, it was nice. Um, I miss it, but it's actually becoming like a ghost town up there anymore. Except for the fact that people ride their motorcycle up there every summer. Her dad and my dad are really good friends. So that's about it. Unfortunate. <laughs> that's why I'm down here, because there's really no jobs in the medical field up there. So. I, I think I remember that. Yeah, all the way down here to Maine. Yeah. Yeah. I still see Sister Time. Yeah. Um, but I haven't seen Lynn in a long time. So, I think we're all back. <laughs> um, how do you think the first half has gone so far? Good. Yeah? Am I effectively teaching you information? Yes. Yeah. yeah. 
You can. You don't have to lie to me. No. <laughs> <laughs> if, is there something you think I should be doing different? No. I mean, I want your feedback so we can make this successful. No, this is good. It's, it's good so far. Mm -hmm. All right. It's a thought and taking in different. words and phrases you're using is something that you know, I think a lot of us have heard, so yeah. Okay. Like the breathing, the tripod, the, those are very important things, I think. Mm -hmm. Good. So next week, am I going to have to make sure that there's chocolate at your facilities? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we have to send a care package down every week. <laughs> that works for us. Well, because nobody's touching it here. Or we're going to start to bring something that makes you guys jealous. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be just, that would be just about anything. You know, my face is really large on that screen. I don't want to look anymore. <laughs> that would be donuts. <laughs> yeah. I have such a dark yeah. weakness. I like that. <laughs> really? Yeah, like, I hear that often. Yeah. You'll hear me say things and you'll be like, oh my goodness, she's yeah. French. <laughs> 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 All right, I'm going to sit for a little while just because my foot hurts a little bit. Um, we, have, we have covered quite a bit. Um, so... Did you all get a chance to go through your sin chart book? No. 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 Um, that is like an independent study, and I think it's in your. It's in the syllabus. Um, I think it's a pretty intuitive program. Uh, it's going to walk you through it, um, practicing putting in information. Um, giving you scenarios and then putting the information into meaningful ways. Um, there are the different types of work, electronic health record, there's the electronic health record, there's the electronic medical record, um, and the paper chart, and the difference between the electronic health record and the electronic medical record is a health record is usually one that is incorporated across a bank of physicians or a physician network, even possibly affiliated with a hospital. So if you went to um, Franklin Hospital and your physician was at Franklin, they can see, he can see what was done at the hospital, your visit, and the, the hospital can see what. Um, problem lists and things you've gone most recently to see the physician. That's an electronic health record. Electronic medical record is usually a single use specific for like a single family practice or a single cardiology practice where it's, it's not networked. Um, the paper chart, some places are still having paper charts and in the middle of the integration. And when you get out into the workforce, knowing what their record is and if it's a paper chart, how it's organized. That's the most important thing um, in having a paper chart specifically is organization. And does your practice maintain it so that it's consistent? If, if you have a medical chart and you're just you know throwing lab values in as they come in, it may be in a chronological order but really is it going to be hard to find um, the physician note? So is there a medical record set up with dividers that, okay, this section is for demographics, their name, address, phone number, insurance, all that stuff. And then is there a divider that has a list of allergies um, in their, say, their advanced directives? Um, another tab for past medical history. Is it set up? in an organized fashion, and is it consistent in every chart? So if it's not consistent in every chart, then how efficiently can the physician utilize that information? Or if you need to access something and it's in a different place in every chart, it's not time efficient. Um, 
So that's where the electronic health record comes in, um, in, in part of meaningful use, is that the information is where you can access it, clicking on a tab, the information's there, and also with that, with the electronic health records, you can query pretty much anything and get data from it. Um, and I'll use the example of, or even say, immunizations for people over 50 or the, new, the pneumonia shots, um, colonoscopies, you know? It's important that everyone over 50 gets their colonoscopy. How is that practice able to determine if all of their population that is over 50 <coughs> received education about the importance of a colonoscopy? Um, and how many actually got it. You can get that information from an electronic record by querying in age, colonoscopy, and it should give you that data, and that data can be printed out. And then during practice meetings, it can be one of your talking points is, you know, only 20% of our population <coughs> has gotten a colonoscopy at the age of 50. What information are we not providing them what do we need to be more? How, um, what sort of edu education materials should we have in the waiting room? Um, even wait times. Um, a lot of practices for meaningful use in patient-centered care are, are monitoring wait times. Um, some practices, in order to do their test of change, if they want to change the workflow of a physician practice, um, some places were giving patients when they came in um, a sheet or a stopwatch and they're tracking their time. And then they, at the end, when they get called in, they, they hand it back in and it says they waited 17 minutes. Um, and say your practice has made a goal of we want to make sure every patient is seen within 12 minutes. So you may have some people that you've tracked, they've done it for 10, and then you had all of a sudden between two and three, the wait times went down to, or up to 17, 18, 19 minutes. So that gives you data on how to look at what's going on in this time period that we can change so that we can improve our wait times and people get people in and seen and taken care of. So the electronic health chart can give you all sorts of information. On the other hand, it's only as good as the person who puts it in. If, if say there's um, a section in the electronic health record under past history where you can put in, you might type in, oh, had their flu shot in 2016. February 2nd, 2016. And then there's another spot that's a tab that says immunizations. If you oh, if you put that immunization for the tetanus or for the pneumonia shot or whatever I just said, the flu shot, whatever it was, <laughs> um, in in the past medical history, and it's not over here in immunizations, and when they query people over 50 that got their shot, this is gonna be messed. So your numbers are not going to be accurate. So you have to consistently input the information where it needs to be in the record in order for it to be meaningfully used. Um, also, with the electronic health record, like I said, it can be it can be shared with multiple providers. Um, if you're going off to a specialist, that specialist can easily get information either if they're connected to that network or it can be easily retrieved and sent to them. Um, some, some physician portals now have appointment scheduler where you can log into their site, new patient, and request an appointment. And you can look, see what the availability is, and put yourself in, um, which saves receptionist time. So it's it's not only effective in managing patient data, it's effective in streamlining care so that most of the care is focused on the patient and not spent doing all these other tasks. So 
the less time people have to be on a phone if they do have that appointment scheduler in there um, that's more time they can uh, they can attend to physician uh, to patient needs uh, let me think of other examples can you guys think of any examples of a health record how you think it would come in handy or be more efficient like an electronic health record well, I lived in Madawaska for all my life, and when I came down here, I have epilepsy, so having that medication or that medical record transfer so easily was amazing. <laughs> right, it streamlined your care, and there was nothing missed. Right. Um, let's think of what else. Privacy. When you have an electronic health record, um, there's less app for breach of a patient's chart because it's not going to be laying out on the counter. Um, papers aren't going to fall out of it in the hallway where somebody might be able to see it. You still have to protect patient information by monitoring your screen and making sure you log off because um, a lot of times the computers for the medical assistant are in the patient room and you're doing that in the treatment room. If you forget to log off when you leave that room, that information is not protected and they actually can potentially access anybody's record. The other nice thing about the electronic health record is it's date and time stamped. So the old paper records, a physician can make it, and I'm not gonna knock physicians, but they're not the best at following orders. They don't like to date and time things. Um, and that's a lot of experience in the hospitals. They write orders and they may write the date, but they forget the time. So it's hard to, you know, you're looking back, you're like, oh my God, I didn't see this order. When was this written? You have no idea. And when you're doing chart audits, um, one of the clinical indicators for chart audits is everything must be dated and timed and signed. In hospitals, physicians' offices can get dinged or penalized because they're not date timing and signing. Even, even your notes, um, nurses' notes, physicians' notes. If it's not date and timed, you know, CMS can come in or any other federal surveying agency can say these orders aren't date and timed and that's, they can get a financial penalty for that. Um, with the electronic health record, it's already there. You make an entry, it's date timed, um, stamped, and it's signature stamped. When you log in, it's you log in as you. So every entry you make is date timed and stamped in with your signature. The other part is with that signature, if you access somebody's chart, like, oh, my friend's my friend came in here last week. I wonder what she came in for. And you access that chart, it's, it's, for lack of a better term, it's none of your business, and it's a violation of their HIPAA right, unless you need to access it because you're providing care. If you're just looking at your friend's chart because you wanted to know what she came in for, that's a violation of HIPAA and you can lose your certification. And every if you logged in, they can query who looked at this chart, and they can see that Megan looked up her best friend's chart, and then they're going to be like, why were you in this chart? <laughs> you, you can. And you can lose your certification because you're accessing a record that you don't need to be in. Um, that's a huge no-no, and the electronic records chart can track that. That's what they told us. <coughs> Yeah. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that the record would show you. We did scheduling, um, ordering. The physicians can order right from there. Lab results can be populated right in there if they're connected to a hospital network. Um, then the physician doesn't have to worry about calling or the lab results that have been faxed and they're lost. 
as well as the technology today, if you have stuff, um, say lab values or work notes or things like that, it can be easily scanned right into the electronic health record. And nothing gets, there's no question. Like, oh, you gave me a work note that said I didn't have to work for four months. Oh yeah, where is it? I didn't give you one. And insurance companies can access that information and they have it all available to them. Um, also easily accessible for patients to access, you know, their own records. That's so. right, exactly. Patients have access, even patients have the right to access their medical record whenever they want to. Right, but it's easier through a portal or, you know. It is, absolutely. Right, right there. My primary care office, I can log into the portal and I can see everything. I yeah. can see all of the diagnoses that he has of me, all my labs. All your vitals, all, everything. Yeah. Everything. Stuff that I don't want to see. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but it's there. And it's also nice because, um, like, for instance, where I work, they have um, a health benefit. If you, if you do physical, um, mammogram, colonoscopy, if you do all the things that you're supposed to do, at the age you're supposed to do it, um, yearly or whatever, before, ours is before the end of May, then you get, I think it's a 10% discount on your insurance premium that you have to pay in. So I can go into my portal and I can be like, okay, I had, when, because you have to fill it out. You, they don't just take your word that you had it done. Right. Um, okay, my mammogram was here. I had my blood drawn here. This was my cholesterol. This was um, my GFR for diabetes. Um, I mean, my A1C for diabetes. Everything's right there. So it's, it's user-friendly for everybody. Um, with the paper chart, they can still access it, but... Are you really going to hand a patient a paper chart and say, okay, look at whatever you want, because then they can take papers out. So you would never hand a patient their medical record without, them, without being supervised. Somebody would sit there with them and let them go through the paper chart, because you don't want anything being removed from the chart. Um, we all have experienced HIPAA. We all know what HIPAA is. We all know that it's a huge violation. Um, patients are informed of it. Um, and there's a big fine. Even, you know, if you're talking, if you're walking a patient to the exit and you're telling them, okay, so you can go over to the hospital, get your x-ray of your foot, then you're going to go to the lab and get your lab, you know, Get your blood work tested for your glute, for your diabetes. If you're saying this in the hallway on the way to their checkout, you have to be mindful are there other patients in the hallway? Is there somebody in that little weight scale thing? Is there, are you close to a patient's room where they can hear through the door? So you have to be very careful about where you're talking with patients about their information. Um, that's that's like the biggest biggest violation of HIPAA is when you're getting caught. You don't even realize it. You think there's nobody around, but somebody overhears it. And that's one of the biggest fears of patients is that their HIPAA is going to be violated, that something is going to be said or shared with people that don't need to know. Um, and I, when I was working in the ICU, I would meet, you know, I would be taking care of people that I know people that my husband knew, people that we hung out with. And the first thing I said, the first thing I said when I was, went in was, um, hey, how you doing? I'm been assigned to be your nurse today. Do you have a problem with that? Because if you have a problem with me taking care of you, it's, it's completely fine. I'm not gonna take offense to it. We wanna make sure you respect your privacy, but I can ensure you that whatever happens here, I'm not going to go home and discuss with my husband, or I'm not going to talk uh, talk about 
with anybody. Or if somebody sees me and says, oh, how's Scott doing? Um, I'm not going to be like, oh, yeah, he's doing great. You know, he's... I said, I can assure you none of that is going to happen. This is completely private. Um, and I give them the option. It, do you want, a, would you prefer and be more comfortable with another or taking care of you? Most of the time they said no. But you just have to make sure that you assure them, if you know them, that everything is going to be confidential. With some sort of restriction, they didn't allow us to do that. And I knew everybody well, yeah. So they were like, oh, you still have to do it. I'm like, you know, if they say that they don't want me to? If they say they don't want you to, then they should, that, that needs to be honored. That needs to be honored. And if there's, if, so if you're in a physician practice and you meet someone and, and maybe that person hates you, and they're like, hey, you ain't taking me in here, then you need to say, I understand. Um, and, I'll, and, and you've, inform the business office manager or whoever is your next on chain of command that this person has requested for whatever reason not to have me take care of them. And that that needs to be honored because the patient has the right to refuse treatment, has the right to refuse care by anybody, and it should not be forced down their throat. So if that happens, you just need to go to somebody higher and make sure that because how uncomfortable is that? Yeah. If they're saying, I don't want you, and you're like, you have to, yeah. that's aggressive, and and it's a violation of their patient rights. Right. So, um, speaking of patient rights, they do have the right to refuse treatment. They do have the right to be informed. <coughs> they do have a right to choose their providers. If, sorry. I think I'm about due for some chocolate. <laughs> Rub it in. <laughs> I love Megan's little response. She gives you that little look out of the corner of her eye. I'm putting salt in my womb. <laughs> I don't like you right now. <laughs> um, is in any conflict resolution or when you're interacting with a patient and say they're like, um, you know, let's go back to the indicator that that, the, that your practice wants to have 90% of their 50 year old population have colonoscopy because they get a reimbursement if they meet that number and you're talking to somebody and they're like nope not doing it and you say well you know this is the importance this is here's education material you could read um, while you're waiting for the physician to come in um, you have any questions, you can just, I'm not doing it. Then you just, then you would just simply say, well, I'm just going to leave this information with you. Um, so you can be informed. You do have the right to refuse and, you know, I'm not going to, we can't make you do it. It's good for you. It's, you know, it's a good indicator of cancer. You educate, you provide the education, but they have the ultimate right to refuse. And they shouldn't be made to feel badly that they said, I don't want it. And maybe whatever reason. A lot of men don't want to have colonoscopy because where it goes. Um, sometimes they just need to know that the, the risks or the violation is far less important. Or you don't want to minimize. You don't want to say far less important. Is the benefit you're going to get is cancer can be picked up so much sooner and prevented and that you're totally asleep. You don't even know what happens. Nothing happens until you're totally asleep. You wake up, you, you don't even know what happened. Sometimes they just need that education. Other times you're just not going to get them to do it. And as long as you provide them with the information and you document it, that is the key. You must document. Document, I can't... I cannot drill in your heads enough about documentation. Everything you do, you need to document. So they can't come around and say, like if the physician's like, Allison, why didn't you talk to this patient about colonoscopy? He has, he's 60 years old now, he hasn't had one. Well, I did, every time he comes in, I, I talk to him about it. Well, he says you've never mentioned it. Well, right here in my 
under chief complaint and whatever, education, pamphlet provided, whatever you provide, hand out for colonoscopy, hand out for pneumovax, hand out, make sure you put it in there. It may take you a few extra minutes, but it covers your butt when somebody comes back and says, you're not, you're not doing your job, you're not giving them the information even with children, parents who don't want to immunize their children. You're providing, you provided them with that information and it's documented. Your butt's covered. Um, I kind of lost track of where I was. Let's see, what, what else did I miss here? <laughs> Filing, I mean, y'all know how to file, right? Okay, yep. I mean, everybody knows the alphabet. Pretty much everything is filed. If, it, if you're having to do paper files, it's filed by alphabetical name. If, if your practice um, has a different filing system, they're going to teach it to you, and it's not hard. So I don't think I need to go over how to file a record. Um, notes, um, the different types of systems, source-oriented medical record, problem-oriented medical record, um, and how physicians write their progress notes. Um, the source is is basically objection objectives and what the progress notes are, what their observations, data collected, and. Um, they're filed in reverse chronological order. So it would go um, most recent to the farthest. The farthest would be in the back. Others go from the first, so the farther back you go is the most recent. Obviously, the most recent the back is more efficient. Um, are you guys familiar with soap notes? Most of you have had any experience as a CNA or in any sort of medical. Are you who isn't familiar with soap notes? Okay, so they call it a soap note because again, it's the acronym: um, subjective, objective, assessment, and plan. Um, it's a good way to communicate information to a provider, and it's a good way for a provider to um, organize their documentation. So they would write down the subjective. Subjective would be what the patient is usually a quote. What exactly did the patient say? I've been coughing for four days. I've had a fever for four days. I'm coughing up green crap. Um, my ear hurts. I've lost 10 pounds. Subjective, quote. Patient states, quote, blah, 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 everything I just said. The objective part, the O, would be where you would document the vital signs, the blood pressure, the temperature, their pulse oximetry, um, their respiratory rate. <clears throat> if you did anything else, like say, maybe they came in with a complaint of burning when they urinate. So, and you go ahead and do a urine dip. So you're gonna put into that objective data um, the results of, and we'll, we'll go through that when we get to it, what the specific gravity and all the things that are in a urine dip that come up, that's, we address that later in the, the class, um, and we'll learn how to do that, but those are the types of things that will go under objective. Under the A for assessment is what the physician finds. Um, lungs are diminished, lungs with rails, lungs with um, ronchi. Those are terms that are used to describe lung sounds. Um, or bowel or abdomen soft, abdomen distended, different things. Whatever his assessment is, is what goes in there. And then based on those three things, he's able to come up with a plan. Okay, the plan is to order a chest x-ray. The plan is to give him a nebulizer treatment because he's really wheezy. Um, I'm going to spend 10 days of antibiotic, inhaler, whatever his orders are, is going to go under that plan. And then there's follow-up, um, see patient a week or two weeks, whatever it is. 
So that's just essentially an easy way to, to remember is the mnemonic soap. Um, sometimes they have an R for response if they're like referring them to, say they were getting referred to a pulmonologist because this is the fourth time they've come in with um, bronchitis or pneumonia and they really should be seen by a pulmonologist to see if there's something else going on or their x-ray came back. Um, they ordered an x-ray and he wants to trigger what is the results. So the R is response to results that are expecting to come back. It's all going to be documented right there, easily accessible. Um, I think, again, you know, make sure you document your education. Drawing a blank on what else. I don't, I don't want to sit here and read this book to you, but I'm just going to briefly go through to make sure I'm not missing key points. Um, oh. So if you're in a paper chart and you chart on the wrong patient, what do you do? You just wrote this whole long subjective thing in the wrong patient's chart because you had three patient charts here and you grabbed one when you went to get the patient and it was wrong patient and you didn't notice and you just wrote patient said he had a fever, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, oh crap, this is the wrong person. Are you supposed to like draw a line through it and initial it? Yes, date, time, initial. So you can strike out any entry that you make simply, but you, it's just one line because they bail. If you scribble it out, then they can, then it leads. Right. It, it makes them think what was written under there that they were hiding. So one simple line, error, your initials, date and time. Um, if, and also works, if the, say the patient went home, you know, left the area and you're like, oh darn, I forgot to write down what, I don't know if you do a pulmonary function test or whatever, you forgot to write something in um, that occurred in that visit, you would write late entry, date, time, and your initials, and then your note. You would always identify it as a late entry. Um, and, and I'm talking paper charts, paper documentation. If it's electronic documentation, it's going to date, time, and stamp. So if you at you saw the patient at 10 o'clock in the morning and you're tidying up at the end of the day, and you've seen 10 patients, and you go back to that patient's chart, it's now 3.30, and you write, um, gave education information on colonoscopy, it's gonna date and sign it at 3.30, but you gave that information when the patient was there at 10. You would need to say in your, at the beginning of your typing note, late entry, provided to patient at time of visit, blah, blah, blah. So you, just have to make sure that the documentation is specific to when it occurred. You can make late entries, you just need to identify it as such. Um, health records, um, destruction, retention of, that's something you need to know about, but it's, I don't, I've not seen where it's, the medical assistant's responsibility to destroy um, records. That's usually medical records or somebody in that area. But it's good to know what their retention policy is. How many years do they hold on to records? Um, how many after so long? You know the difference between active, inactive, and closed records? Yes, everybody? Mm -hmm. Anybody not? No? Okay. So it's good to know how long a patient is absent or hasn't gone, come to the physician's practice for a visit um, as to what, their, what the practice's time frame is before that patient is considered to be moved to inactive status. And um, if it's a closed status, is it documented why it's closed? The patient moved out of town or did the patient expire? 
And sometimes you may not know the patient expired because the family doesn't call and tell you. Um, sometimes it just may be seen in the paper. And, and that's the only way you can know to close that to close that file if somebody hasn't told you that the person has passed on. Usually if a patient moves out of town, they're going to tell you because they're going to request their records be transferred. Um, destruction, that's, I mean, practices are required to hold on to records for a certain period of time and depending on what um, their retention policy is, is how many years. Um, for Medicare, Medicaid payers, I believe the book said it was 10 years. Um, I'd, have to, I'd have to go back. But I think it, if it's Medicare or Medicaid, CMS funded, you need to retain them for a minimum of years. You can retain them for as long as you want, but you can't get rid of them before that. And with electronic health records, it's not taking up any space. You're not filing cabinets. You're not losing um, treatment room space to maintain files. So that's another benefit of the electronic health record. Um, there's a whole bunch in here on how to file color coding and all of that. That's It's kind of whatever your practice does. It's kind of common sense. Everyone knows how to everyone knows how to do that. I don't think I need to reiterate it, although I've said it like three times, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to keep talking about that, but yet then I do. <laughs> um, wow, I think we I think we went through everything. And I didn't even move my PowerPoint that far. Um what sort of stuff do you want me to go over again? What's, what things do you need reinforced? Or what questions do you have um, after you kind of did your homework and prep for this class? Do you still have questions that weren't unanswered? Stuff you want to explain better? Um, my biggest concern, I feel like, is I have never worked in the medical field, like all these CNAs. Um, but so all this medical terminology that's being thrown our way, I feel like so overwhelmed about. Um, so before moving forward, how important is it that I know all these 75 words? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, do I have time to learn these in this like you, short period of time? <laughs> you, if you get behind, you just need to let us know and we'll give you more time to get done what you need to do. Right. Um, a lot of things with the medical terminology, that's the best. Yeah, it's, it's break. It's like you said, repetition, flashcards. Right. Do you have someone that can quiz you with them? Yes. Um, that's going to help a lot. And and when you start to learn the suffixes and the prefixes, and a lot of those words are going to fall in because you're going to know what the end means. Itis means infection. Right. And you know pancreas is pancreas. So pancreasitis, pancreatitis, is inflammation and infection of the pancreas. So you'll be able to start to join those words together as we move forward. It'll make more sense because you're learning the basics. Um, let's see. It will. It'll fall right into place. So let's say I start next week. Would you say it's extremely important to know all the vocab from week one that was assigned to us to know all of that before we start week two? Um, I'm looking to see what your vocab is. In the book? In kids? I'm talking medical about like medical terminology. The okay. See, like I have all my note cards, but I feel super pressured to know all these note cards before next week. And that's where I'm becoming a little overwhelmed with the whole. Okay. So it does talk about the basic word structure, like I just said, right. on how to structure words, the root, the suffix, the prefix, um, the combining vowel, which is usually an O. Um, so next week is infection, 
infection control, and let's see. Next week, next week, next week. Just check it out. I thought next week. Next week is infection control. Let me look. Getting a brain cramp. I can tell you. Actually, I think next week, next week is not infection control. Infection control is week three. So next week is going on to patient assessment, patient education, and nutrition and health promotion. That's, so you're going to skip chapter three next week. Right. And just do four, five, and six. Um, when we get into infection, um, and then it's going to become a lot more important. Of course, you know, you want to learn it as much as you can because each week it's going to get more and more in depth. Right. Um, looking back at, I, I don't, that makes me yeah. see. we're supposed to be doing um, medical terminology lesson one. Yeah. And two, I thought. That's, that's what I'm trying, I'm trying to do over here. Uh, it's just one. I thought it was just... Under, hold on. Medical terminology, chapter one. And then you have module one, lessons one through three. So it's basically um, learning the word structure. Okay. So it's mm -hmm. the whole word will come together, but I think it's mostly going to be asking you the structure. What does the prefix mean? When can you can you identify what the suffix is? Can you identify what the root is? Can you identify what the connecting vowel is? Um, So I wish, let me see if I can, let me see if I can pull something up for you. Not for sure, it was not chapter two or two. I don't, I don't see, I do not, I see chapter. I'm just trying to pull up where I saw, I saw that. It is, it's just chapter one, and chapter one, actually, Megan, is yeah. continued into week two. Oh, that makes me feel better. So, in week three, so week four is when you start chapter two. Oh, cool. That's great. That's so great. you that have makes a lot me... of modules to get done within chapter one. That's awesome. I kind of jumped the gun, I guess. I think it's going to be pretty intuitive. Um, you can learn it at your pace. And if you have questions, you can bring those questions to class. And I'm just going to look here. And I think, Megan, I think you have all the tools you need. Right. To, because your learning style, I mean, look at your little index card. You like my niece. <laughs> Um, yeah, they're not very neat, but they're effective. When I did my CNA, like, that's what I did. I studied flashcards. Day yeah. Day after day after day after day, and I learned 350 words. Right. And how long, though? How long did it take you to learn 350 but, words? But, um, well, when I, I took my CNA, like, senior year. Yeah. So, from, like, September to June, I think, we were able to do 350 words. But Once also, we... Megan, try to try not to look at the big picture. You're going to get overwhelmed. Yeah. Right. Try not to look at it as I've got to learn 350 words or 1,000 words. Because as you progress, right. the same prefixes are going to mean, the prefixes are always going to mean the same. Okay. The suffixes are always going to mean the same. Depth. Right. They just can't be blended together. Okay. Um, like ostomy and otomy. 
or ostomy. Okay, ostomy is a scope. Ostomy is an opening. Um, what was the other way I said? Ostomy. Um, um, an ectomy. Ectomy <coughs> is, is removal of. So if you put the word colo or colon, what does colon mean? The colon? Mm -hmm. Colon is um, your intestine. Okay. So do you know what a colonoscopy is? So it would be the removal, right? No. Colonoscopy is when they go in with a scope, through your oh, rectum, right. look at the cords. Right oh, yeah, so I didn't even remember what the word was, but yes, that makes sense. <laughs> okay, so you take the word colon. Yeah. You know that is um, an area of the intestine. Right. That comes up from the rectum. We'll, we'll do anatomy and physiology after that. So right. you can take colon... And you can have colonoscopy. Uh, it has scope right in it. Scope. Okay. scope. Yeah. Um, ectomy is removal. A col so that would be a colectomy. Means they took a part of that colon out. Um, colostomy is an opening to the outside. Ostomy is the opening to the outside. So that means they took a section of the colon and put it to the outside. So now okay. you're going to lost to me where the, the fecal material is going to drain into a bag. And um, so you've used that word colon four times with four different meanings. But you know the word, the base right. word, and you know the four endings. So now you can pair that with anything. You can pair that with... Um, Gastro, gastroscopy, gastrectomy, um, appendectomy, your appendix, ectomy, it was removed. Um, that makes tonsils. Sense. So what would you what would be removal of a tonsils? I don't know what tonsils is, so <laughs> tonsils. tonsils so, little... so it would be so, a tonsillectomy. Yay! <laughs> I didn't know if tonsils had a fancy, <laughs> fancy word or something. I'm a newbie. Oh. I'm newbie. So, you'll get it. You'll get it. <laughs> so, okay, so tonsil, oh, removal of the tonsils, tonsillectomy. Right. Removal of the adenoids. Adenoidectomy? Yeah. <laughs> she did that one all wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't yeah. miss Rose that time. <laughs> Uh, I'll get it. No, and I read the chapter, um, and I was understanding it, and I took the quiz, and I did great on the quiz, but um, it was just, I did all those vocabs on the cards, and then I was like, holy cow, this is a lot of words, and not a lot of time, but I feel a lot better. <laughs> yeah, just realize that you break it down into small tasks, you have good, you have good... I'm getting a brain cramp. Um, what am I looking for? Study skills. Thank you. Skills, you have the stu good study skills. Yeah. You have what you need. You're smart. Um, don't get overwhelmed by the number when it comes to medical terminology because it will all start to fall in once you know the roots and the prefixes and endings. Okay. Once you know that cysto means bladder, then cystoscopy. Um, once you know that, I'm trying to think of other words. Um, yeah, okay. Small bladder is coli. So cholecystectomy, which is C-H-O-L-E. Once you know those terms for the different organs that don't have the same sound, like tonsils and tonsillectomy, gallbladder is coli, you'll be able to formulate those words and make meaning out of it. Right. It just seems like a lot right now. Yeah, like the nephro, like I would never know that means kidney. Right. So <laughs> once you do those, those pieces, the rest of it's all going to come in 
it's all going to fall in. Once you right. learn well, that, like the nephro is something you can study alone. Because right. Because you'll know. Yes, yeah. and I have that note card that right. has that on it. So, yep, yeah, exactly. All right, makes sense. Okay. You're going to do awesome. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Anybody else have any other questions or stuff they want us to review? Megan is like, done, pack it up, we're out of here. <laughs> that was my biggest concern. This whole time I was sitting here thinking like, holy cow, I need to learn all these words and terms. And oh, we should have brought it up at the beginning. We could have relate <laughs> all these fears. No, I feel better now, so we're good. Good. Um, Bailey... Heather, anything? I'm good. Yeah, they were there. Yeah, me too. <laughs> what? We forgot that they were there. Sorry. <laughs> I'm trying not to forget them, but they're so tiny. I know. I, I really Maybe there's a way to make them. us tiny next time. Well, it goes <laughs> tiny if they, it goes big if they speak. Oh. You guys need to talk more so my face gets off the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, then I guess in closing, uh, we're going to be done a little early. I hope I don't get in trouble for that, but, um, I think we covered, did you think we covered everything efficiently and thoroughly? Yeah. All right. Um, I guess I'm going to ask for feedback from you all and I want you to be honest. How do you feel this class went? How do you feel the pace went? Um, how do you feel my learning techniques? Are they effective for you? Is there something I should change to make next week better? Or do something differently to make it more interesting or not talk as much? I want your feedback because this is your class. I think as long, I think as, long as we're talking about the things that are going to be on the, the final national exam, as long as we're pinpoint highlighting those things, then I think that that's great. Yep. Yeah. And and as we progress and get towards you know and closer towards the end, we're going to be highlighting them. Um, they're highlighted in your book when it you know the critical when it says critical points or whatever it says in the book. Those are key things that you really want to take note of. Um, and we will be reviewing a lot towards the end of the class as we, you know, the end of the semester, we will be doing a lot more review so that what we've learned now will be coming forward at the end to refresh. And we'll make sure, it's my goal to make sure you are absolutely prepared for that test. And if at any time you feel like you need one-on-one -on -one, extra help or something like that, just let me know. Um, we can figure out a time that maybe I can spend a little extra time with you and help you understand something if you're really not getting it. I don't know. Thursday, are we going to be going over the same thing in like a more hands-on way or what should we look forward to on Thursday? Yeah, Thursday, um, I've reached out to the, to your clinicals and clinical instructors and what my approach to Thursday is going to, and, and I think that's what they're going to follow as well, is um, it's going to be really informal. I think we're going to do role playing of a patient coming in. Um, what do you do when a patient comes in? How do you document a chart? Um, somebody's going to be an angry person and how you're going to confront it or scenarios of coworkers who are doing stuff that aggravate each other, how are you going to handle it? Um, critical, you know, I think it's going to be more interactive and kind of role play stuff. Okay. Because this is not tangible things that we can say, okay, we're going to learn how to do blood pressures. We're going to learn how to take temps. This is more critical thinking and practicing the skills of learning to be assertive and how to handle difficult situations. Um, in interviewing techniques. So it's going to be more like that. Okay. Now on Tuesday nights, will we be doing any review of our homework, like the things that we do on our own? Will we review any of that together? As um, I know when I took my CNA course, it, 
it was very helpful when we'd all bring in our homework and we'd all sit around and go over that, make sure everybody was on the same page, everybody had the right answers, things like that. Are we, will we do any of that? I can, I can accommodate whatever your needs are. If you want to make that part of the class, we can absolutely do that. Okay, I wasn't sure what the criteria was for you for teaching the class, so I didn't know, you know. I know that it was very helpful. That way everybody knew, you know, if their answers were way off and they were wrong and, you know, we all were regrouped and everybody got on the same page that way. Right. Um, you take your tests, you get your score. Does it give you your correct answers? Yes. It does. Okay. Okay. Um, so you... I would, if it was me, when I, I took the more test, or less like for, me, for the medical terminology, like going through, you know, some of these things and making sure people were. Well, they do have the right answers on a page. I know because I checked on my answers. <laughs> Sometimes of seeing right. it, right. hearing yeah. it, yeah, makes yeah. it absorb a little bit better. I definitely understand that. Then just mm -hmm. seeing it on a computer, saying, "Oh, that was right." Right. You know? yeah. Right. If we. Yeah. Because the medical terminology part of the program is supposed to be done independent study, yeah. um, and my teaching is, is the kin's book, and we have a limited amount of time to get through that, that's right. what the focus is, but I encourage you to, if you have questions, if you come to class with a list of questions saying these words for medical terminology, I just don't get. It's just not making any sense. Um, or I, on chapter five, they were talking about whatever. It didn't make any sense to me. I read it a hundred times and I just don't get it. Right. Make sure you bring those specific questions and we will address them and go over it and then everyone will be getting the same information. Okay. Um, I will be able to dissect a lot of time to the medical terminology portion, but I, I was just using that as an example, but yeah, you know, and it could be the Kins book. It could be the yeah, anything that you I I want and like we said is it is fast paced. This class used to be two years long. Right. Now it's eight weeks, seventeen weeks. Um. A ton of information thrown at you, and a lot of stuff you got to do independently. I I understand that, and I can I empathize with everything you have to do. I I'm not I don't want to come in here next Tuesday and be like, okay, we are on chapter four, and even one of you is back on chapter two, going, I just can't get this. And you don't let me know because it's just going to increase your stress, increase your anxiety moving forward because you're going to be like, I still don't understand what was in chapter two. Right. Okay. The only way I'm going to know is if you bring those questions to class and we will take the time to make sure that we, that you get that understanding. Right. Okay. But it makes me feel better knowing that we'll address everything we just addressed on Thursday too, just in a hands-on way because I feel like I'll learn a lot better that way. Yes. We will. Yeah. Fran, can I just ask one question? Absolutely. Um, so I feel like I ran a little behind. I did the sure path quiz online that I guess was supposed to be done for Saturday night. And I read the Kins two uh, chapters. Right. And, and I did the first chapter assignments in the book of the medical terminology, but there's still all these other, like assignment 13, 36, and 107 that I haven't done yet. It, are those things that- They're due Saturday. Saturday due, afternoon. Saturday. Saturday. No, no like Saturday. this Saturday that's coming up. No, this, there, when it's assigned to you, um, like week one, for next week you should have read your chapters so you'd be prepared to participate in class um and like I read and the tests that are involved um are to be completed 
prior to Saturday at midnight so that the, the, the test can get logged in? Last Saturday for this. No, for this because first week. you're testing on the information that you learned in this class. Yeah. Oh, so, so we didn't have to do it before last Saturday? No. No. Has oh. to be. Because how can you really test on something you haven't been taught yet? Well, because someone that, told... Except for the medical terminology. That's independent study. You have to do that at your own pace. Oh, because but someone told me it had to be done last Where Saturday night. Um, I thought... Class hadn't even started yet. Those yeah, I know. I thought we had to have it done before the first class. Okay, well, that's good to know. Yeah. Yeah. Whoever was on the it said the updated syllabus, and then it has an attachment. Okay. So, one of these books, this one. So, they told you that it had to be done before class? Yeah. It was last week on the phone. Yeah. And they went home and they said they were their homework. They didn't tell me that, which I'm thankful for, because I did not do it as well. But I didn't, but it didn't make any sense to me like when I was doing it. How are you? You're welcome. <laughs> That book for like all the tests, everything that's due. I mean, but I don't have. If you've got it done, it just has to be done before Saturday at midnight. I mean, you can do it whenever you want, um, and and you can take the test as many times as you want. If you want to test yourself before the information and test yourself after the information, you can do that. Well, I think the reason why uh, everyone. Things that we'll do that Saturday is because we were supposed to originally start the class at least. So the only right, the only right. But is the big is the big test? Yep, yeah. and the the yeah. big yeah. test is the because yeah. it says it says in the big book in the kinder book. So everything else is at home. Yeah. Okay. So in these in your syllabus under week one, mm -hmm. it says your weeks are Sunday through Saturday. This work that they're listing below. Week one says should be completed prior to Saturday. Saturday before starting okay. week two. Two. Good. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I still that. So it'll be tonight's lesson and Thursday yeah. night's lesson and then. So you all till Saturday. Saturday. Yeah. Saturday. So your week. Oh no. So that's crazy. Yeah. So week one stuff needs to be before done before week two. Week two needs to be done before week three. You just have to okay. go. That's good one. to know. That's good to know. That's good. That's great. Thank you. Awesome. I see Bailey and Heather are just like talking to out the door. They look like little mannequins. Yeah, they do. So I can see them. <laughs> Next time, I'm going to go way back yeah, there. Too. I'm going to Dover. Yeah. Bailey, say something. Hi. It didn't Hi. move them forward. I don't know why. It hasn't moved them forward all night for us. I haven't I seen know. them. I graduated in 2012, too, so at least I have somebody my age. No okay. offense to everybody else, but... <laughs> right? Hey, yeah, I know. Yeah. I'm glad I got some people my age. So. Um, what was I going to say? Well, Bailey and Heather, because you, because you look so tiny in our screens, <laughs> it makes me feel... I shouldn't say it makes me. I feel like I haven't been including you in the class because you look like you're in the next, like, in the next parking lot. Do you feel, I mean, do you see us clearly and do you feel like you've been actively included in the class? Yeah, we yeah. can see you guys just fine. You do. And so you feel yeah. like we're present for you. Yeah. Okay. Because that's my worry is like, I can barely see you. So I'm like, Maybe they're not, maybe I'm not able to teach them well because they're so far away, but it's just a perception. I just want to make sure you're getting this, you're understanding and getting information. Blah, 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 blah. I tend to ramble. All right, y'all have a good night. Hey. <laughs>